can you give uh, an audience a little bit of a rundown, kind of like where you came from, a uh, little journey into what you're up to now, and then yeah, what, what you're doing these days? Sure, Rob. I um, moved to Guelph about 32 years ago. Met my wife when she was a student at the University of Guelph, and moved here uh, to be closer to her, and eventually get married. From where? Uh, I grew up in Oshawa. Okay, yeah, yeah. Fun, little fun fact: my wife and I were born in the same hospital in Montreal. No way. Across the street from the Montreal Forum. Nice. So oh, hence the Habs fans. We're both Habs fans. That's right. The whole family's Habs fans. And we're not going to hold it against you today. It's Thank you good. very much. Actually, I kind of like the Habs. There we go. Um, so I moved to Guelph in 87. I uh, got offered a job with Gansby Manerol, uh, with Doug Gansby. Yeah. And uh, been there for 32 years. Sort of uh, worked, uh, started working in construction surveying and out on construction projects. And sort of slowly moved left and right up the ladder. And uh, at the moment, I'm the branch manager of the Guelph office. And... Uh, the company itself is a little over 200 people. It's now GM Blue Plan. We had a merger in 2014, and the Guelph office is around 70 people. And uh, it's been growing at a rate of 10 to 20 percent over the last number of years. And uh, it's been a fun ride. That's cool. I mean, yeah. and to grow at that kind of pace, at that level of maturity, says a lot about the company in a big, big way. Yeah, I think a company really needs to, you know, uh, when a company gets to be 20, 30 years in business, you know, got a lot of things figured out. You got the finances behind you and uh, the maturity that you can move forward. But with demographics, everybody's retiring. So we do have, uh, like most companies, we have a, you know, there's a big uh, experience gap. Okay, cool. And like succession planning is That's a hot right. topic and all that good stuff. You know what? I was very fortunate <clears throat> uh, to work with Doug and Frank uh, at Gansby Mineral. They had a succession plan in place. So I, I actually became a partner in 2003. You know, I was 38 years old. And uh, so that's 15 years ago now already. I can't wow. believe how so time flies. One of the few organizations that had a plan in place way back when. That's right. Apparently, <clears throat> Doug and uh, Bill Manerell, uh, they they wanted to retire at 55, but sort of because of the uh, economies in the 90s, right. they had to push that out to 60, 65. And but they always had this plan to sort of uh, bring in the younger the younger folks and transition the company. And we've continued that. With our company succession plan, we now have uh, 35 partners. We have a, a number of uh, partners that have just come in over the last five years. Cool. Uh, sort of as a look to the future, so carry thing, carry the torch forward. Well, and that kind of segues nicely into one of the topics that we were talking about earlier, just before we kind of got in the car and started, I started driving, was this idea of um, new leaders. You know, whether they're young or you know maybe further in their career, uh, the idea of people that have been maybe really good at the typical work that they do. Yeah. Or they've been spotted as a rising star in the organization, but haven't necessarily led people before, then taking that step into a leadership position, and like, that's a big leap. That's a big leap, especially in the uh, engineering world, because everyone is kind of already technically sound, and typically the people who are technically sound, you know, they end up being the managers of a department, or become the leaders, and uh Engineering skills are way different than leadership skills. So, <laughs> what do you mean, Steve? <laughs> what are you talking yeah, about? Well, you know, engineering is math and calculations and and that sort of thing. And leadership is people. And what and, are people? And Irrational people? and emotional. People are crazy. You know, there's songs <laughs> about that. Um, lots of them. Lots of them. So, gotta love a good country song because everybody's crazy. So, what from your perspective then is something you know for the young leaders that might be watching this? Um, or people that are bringing young leaders into their organization, uh, what's kind of one thing that you think is really important uh, as a young leader to, to kind of focus on? Well, I think one of the main things I kind of preach to our young leaders is sort of self-awareness, and uh, that leadership starts with you. It's not about you, it's about your people, but to be a leader, you have to uh, sort of learn the tools of leadership so that you can be sort of the best leader you can be for your people. Um, which means, you know, you have to hopefully you have somebody that you admire or somebody can mentor you. Hopefully uh, you have to sort of put in the time. you got to do the work. you got to read the books. Yeah, okay. Um, so and you got to analyze the situations. On that note then, so, I mean, you said, you know, mentorship. Uh, you talked about the idea of doing the work yeah. um, and analyzing the situation. So maybe we can just unpack those ideas, you know, as, as part of this. So, you know, when it comes to mentorship, um, I think a lot of people are, you know, understand the idea of having a mentor yep. but I'm not sure if a lot of people have an idea of like how to do it or where to go or... well it's it's kind of hard to mentor like when you get to a certain age you kind of want to take someone under your wing right. and so you sort of you know my style has been to give them suggestions and give them you know and see if they pick it up see if right. they do the work 
Um, because if somebody, there's a lot of people out there that maybe want to be mentored, but they don't realize that even being a mentee, you still have to do the work. You still have to do something. You have to want to change. You can't change people. Like, Rob, you go, go home and try and change your wife. You know how well that's going to work. <laughs> um, so you have to change yourself. That's the only thing you can change. Uh, so if you want to change the situation, you have to change how you're approaching the situation uh, and how you can, say, better inform the situation or come at it from a different angle. You have to change. That's cool. Um, so from a, a young leader, uh, for me, my path was um, Frank McCallum gave me a book and I read the book and the book was, it was a really little fable. I've given it to a lot of staff and it's called Who Moved My Cheese? Right, it's so good. It's so good, about a couple of mice, right? Four mice, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, I think I had to read that three or four times before I get it. And sometimes I give it to staff and uh, they come back and uh, it's very rare that someone comes back the first time and kind of understands it. But from there, I went, you know, to then starting to read. You know, like you start, usually you start with the Dale Carnegie books, the Stephen Covey books, all of that stuff. Anything come to mind though that's something that you think is worthwhile for other people to pick up? Um, I guess finding the time to do it, because at the time, you know, I was 38 years old when I sort of became a partner, and all of a sudden the pressure's on, and you're feeling the stress. And uh, I was saying, okay, I've read a couple of these books, and they actually gave me some some tricks or some tips that I could implement in what I do. Yeah. Um, but I was finding a hard time finding the time to read. I had two little kids at home. Um, I used to enjoy reading the paper on a Saturday or Sunday morning because I, I get up early. Yeah. And on Saturdays and Sundays, the house would sleep in. I'd get to read the paper for an hour. I actually just switched from reading the paper to reading a book. Awesome. And then I went to two days a week, I would get up at 5.30 and read a book. And these are the little tricks that people don't tell you. Right. Like, Doug and Frank never, they said, here, read this book. They didn't say... How do you find the time to do it? How do you carve time out to do it? That's right. So you have to sort of find those little things that work for you. I'm a morning person, so getting up half an hour earlier, 45 minutes earlier, wasn't an issue for me. Um, if you're not a morning person, you're a night hawk, then you got to read at night or something like that. Yeah. I'm a big fan of reading uh, reading books. So what's a couple of books that come to mind from your perspective? You mentioned uh, Who Moved My Cheese. And then yeah. about... Uh, so Dale couple. Carnegie, you know, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Amazing. Amazing book. Worth the read like five, ten times over. That's right. Um, Stephen Covey, you know, the seven habits of highly successful people. So good. Um, one of the big habits I, I do, I try and turn everything into a habit. So that way I don't have to think about things. I just do it. Yeah. So one thing I do is I, we have to do timesheets. I do my timesheet every Sunday night at eight o'clock. Uh, usually my parents over for dinner and my, I will sort of kick them out or say, okay, I'm leaving the, the discussion at eight o'clock. I open my laptop, do my timesheet, look at my, look and kind of plan my mind for the week ahead. Cool. And my mother will say, oh, it must be 8 o'clock. Right. You know, there he goes. But <laughs> for me, I've carved out that hour on a Sunday night, and that kind of sets me up for the week. Uh, other good books out there. Um, recently, like Find Your Why with Simon Sinek. Anything so, by yeah. Simon Sinek. Yeah, he's great. Leaders um, He Last is a great one. That's right. I haven't read that one. It's yet. so good. It's all um, about creating an environment of safety for your people right. so they can trust each other. Yeah, um, so there's also one called uh, by Stephen Covey called... Uh, smart trust or the speed of trust other good books cool that's awesome so we talk about mentorship i think what's really interesting too in that idea is that mentorship don't necessarily always have to be human to human you know i've found a lot of mentors in books that's right you know i think this even those those authors um you know it's covey or carnegie or lencioni or maxwell or simon Sinek. Yep. you got they're like mentors in a book and i actually have read all those books or know or know all those names yeah that's cool um i always find with a book when I'm reading a book, I dog ear the page. If I see a quote or something that's interesting, I dog ear the page. And then uh, when I'm done reading the book, I'll go back, open up those pages. Usually 90% of the times I can figure out why I dog eared it. Right. And I, I, I keep this Word document of all these quotes. That I, I started that document in about 2010, and it's about 30 pages long now. Awesome. But those are the little tricks that you have to do to sort of reset that into your mind. Well, I think what you just said there segues into your second point earlier which was do the work that's right you know you got to find a mentor you got to do the work and so yeah. you know when it comes to becoming a, a leader whether you're you know just setting out in leadership or you've been in leadership for quite some time that doing the work idea one of the things that seems like from your perspective is worthwhile is okay you got to study you do if you want to learn i suck at basketball so i don't play basketball right. but uh, when I was a kid, I just it just a sport that didn't work for me. And I'm a pretty sportsy guy. I, I play hockey. I played lacrosse. But when I started playing lacrosse, I started playing in grade nine, and I hadn't played it before. 
And I used to practice every night, bouncing the ball off the brick wall of my mother's kitchen. She used to always yell at me. And I, I learned to play right-handed, play left-handed. Yeah. And in the end, you know, I, I made the lacrosse team in high school. I was a captain of the lacrosse team in grade 12 and 13 because I put in the work. And I worked really hard. And I wasn't the best player on the team, but I worked hard yeah. to learn that skill. And leadership is no different. Um, management is no different. Coaching is no different. You have to do the work to gain the skill. In engineering, you have to go through your uh, your engineering protocols, your sort of little apprentice to figure out how to be successful at your job and how to get your stamp. Um, leadership is the same thing. Yeah. You have to, uh, you know, you can go to formal classes, um, but, you know, getting a mentor, reading books, I've kind of done it mostly on my own with mentors and reading, and uh, but then reaching out because once you start into this path of sort of leadership learning, all of a sudden you're going to identify with other people that you work with, either they're your uh, colleagues, they're your clients, they're people that you know from the community, because leaders tend to, they tend to be a little bit visible, and you just start talking to them about leadership topics, and you'd be amazed at conversations you can have. It's so true, and it was one of the things that um, I love about what you just said, is like cool that uh, Darren Hardy talks about, I think it's his dad that actually brought up, I don't know if you've heard of Darren Hardy, but he did uh, the name. Success I Magazine, That's he's, right. he's got the compound effect, uh, and entrepreneur roller coaster and a couple others, uh, but it was the idea of uh, talk about things that matter to people who care. That's right. Well, you have to care. Yeah. I was saying to uh, somebody, like, I've got a pretty stressful job, I trying to manage an office of 70 people and doing project work, managing clients and managing projects and getting things done. And I'm typically on the construction side, which can get a little bit hectic. crazy, hectic, <laughs> like when there's machines working and things go wrong, you, they need answers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have to just sort of be aware and, and be available. And uh, yeah, so where I was going was, I generally do that now without being stressed. I, I, I sort of say to people, I, I care very deeply but I've managed to find a spot where I can care deeply and deal with issues without getting stressed out or really stressed out. Right, that's cool. Although my staff would say at the end of last week I was pretty stressed out, which it was, yeah. but I'm glad enough. I'm glad that I that I that uh, we have an office where we can be human. So then stress goes up and down and, you know. It is, it's, it's, it's part of the world, it's right? part of the world. You know, leaving your emotions at the door is kind of a thing that's difficult to do, especially yeah. when the emotions happen within the workplace. That's right. Uh, but I'd love to just learn a bit more about what you just said there you know uh, it sounded like at one point in your career um, you know you want me out you've always cared about what you're up to and what you're doing and what you're leading um, but at one point you know the stressors would maybe get to you a little oh, bit yeah. more than they do oh, today yeah. and that might show up in terms of you know uh, uh, emotions on your shoulder or whatever on your sleeve and now you're you've, you've found some ways to maybe be a bit more calmer as you deal with the yep. similar same stressors oh I'm glad you asked that question so how well, for me, uh, you know, I became a partner at 38, so there's a lot of stress when you're a young partner, and you also have young children at home, and like my early 40s was, was rough, and um, I got into running, and I started to run, and I'm a big guy, I don't, I don't run, you, people don't think of me as a runner, <laughs> I'm, I'm a freight train, right? yeah. and my wife wanted to take a learn to run class, so we took a, a learn to run class at uh, the running room, and uh, I kind of said, okay, I can run 5K, and then I did a 10K uh, course, ran a 10K, and uh, I kind of backed off running, to be honest with you, but that also coincided with uh, a gym, Mulvani, that opened up about 10 years ago, so I got a gym membership, and I would go to the gym two or three mornings a week and work out on, on the Stairmaster or something like that by myself, and I found that really helped with the, uh, with the stress. Really? Yeah. Oh, for sure. The exercise and that. I've always played hockey. And, uh, you know, one interesting thing, like today, we play hockey at work on Wednesday mornings. And this morning was the last hockey game for the year. So we went out for breakfast before this. Um, but one thing, we started that about 15 years ago. And one thing I started noticing, the best work day for me was on Wednesdays. Cool. Because, like, we got up, we played hockey at 7 in the morning, you had a good sweat on, then you go to work. It doesn't matter what happened. Wednesdays were always good. Yeah, yeah. So then I kind of observed that, and I went then started going to the gym now the last uh two and a half years i've been hitting hard at orange theory fitness so orange theory guelph hey, thumbs, hey, up. thumbs up and uh i go you know three times a week at 5 15 in the morning and there's a class there and i've never uh, worked out so hard in my life but i feel great uh, my stress levels are down awesome. and uh, i'm surviving this crazy life you know it's so 
awesome. We all know we need to exercise. That's right. We all know we need to eat well. We all know we need to sleep well. And those are like the three kind of pillars of, you know, showing up in the world That's well. Right. Um, I think it's often forgotten. And uh, entrepreneurs specifically, I feel like, have this tendency to think, well, I don't need it. You know, I yeah. can do it without what everybody else needs it with. Um, same with rest, you know, yeah. like vacation times. I, f I find a lot of entrepreneurs, I haven't taken a vacation in two years or, you know, the last time yeah. I took a vacation was, a, you know, so far long ago. That's exactly true. I, um, for me, like, I do get lots, of, I do get my seven hours of sleep every night. Uh, I do work out. Um, my, my diet could be better, but it's okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you talk about rest and vacations, you know, I look back six, seven years ago, there was there was a year I took seven days off and I'd worked 22 Saturdays. Jeez, and, uh, that's a big year. That's a big year. That was maybe about seven, eight years ago. Right. Um, you know, my, my wife's on me hard to take vacations and now I think I'm up to taking, you know, three and a half weeks a year. Nice. Or four weeks, uh, maybe four weeks this year, um, which has been pretty rare up until the last couple of years. But finally, I've woken up that I need that break. Um, one thing we, we have started doing is my wife and I might go on three-day weekends. Uh, we have a motorcycle, we tour around, awesome. and uh, got the motorcycle in 2011, so about seven years ago, and I f went on a three-day weekend, I came back, and I felt like I'd been on away for a month. Cool. So we sort of identified, I identified that, you know, even if I can get three days um, away doing something else, I can come back and be fresh, and I think that's helped, uh, and helped so at the office as well. You mentioned that, like, you've, you've woken up to learn this. So when, yeah. when did you start practicing this, this this idea of, you know, taking rest to become fresh, to be your best self when you come back to work? I'd say probably five years ago. And so, I, was a, I was a late bloomer, I guess, in well, waking up to that. I, I don't think you're alone, no, though. No, I'm you not. Know? And so here's the other thing. This is where I find it fundamentally, uh, you know, paradoxical. I have this assumption that human beings uh, essentially don't do well when they're told well, I know I don't. <laughs> I and really don't. I know my kids don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know I don't. And I think, you know, to, to, you know, there's certain levels of, uh, there's a spectrum. Some people, like, just don't, really, they have a huge don't tell me what to do factor. Yeah. Other people, not as much. Um, but at the end of the day, I think everybody has a little bit of don't tell me what to do. I want to figure out myself. We're all kind of autonomous, independent beings. We want to figure out and learn on our own. So, you know, taking this lesson out of, you know, your book around taking this time, and it was a late bloomer. What can you say, tell a story about without just telling young leaders to take the time uh, that might help nudge somebody towards learning this a bit faster than, say, you know, you got to do the work. You got to read the books or, or whatever it is, whatever format, you know, whether it's uh, looking at uh, podcasts. I guess it's new. I'm not a technological guy, but. No, that's you know, cool. I mean, Audible. I, I, I use Audible, Audible books. Yeah. I've, I've listened to lots of Audibles. My wife has suffered two drives to Ottawa <laughs> <coughs> listening to um, listening to Audible, Audible books. Usually she's good for about two hours, then we have to shut it down. That's but pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, some of them can be pretty dry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just you just got to be aware. And I don't think, even for me, like when you're coming up, you're, you're trying to do the best you can. Plus, you're all, usually you're doing this concurrently with working. On your on, at your job, right? So it's not like you're you're not doing your work. It's like you're doing your work, trying to get it done, trying to grow uh, that side of it. But then you're also trying to grow as a leader, which is a you know almost like an MBA course while you're while you're at work, right? And it just it t it takes time. It's like you know it takes five years to get five years experience. For me, when I look at back my path, I don't know that I would change too much. Um, I think it just the learning came when it when it was the time to arrive. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and I'm just glad that I was observant enough that okay, th that I observed that I changed a little. I made a little tweak. I made a, a little tweak, and something changed for the positive. So I'll just carry on with that. And if I if I sensed I needed to change something, I would make a little tweak and see what happens. Cool. Um, so you, mentioned you can sorry you can read all these books and they all give you lots of tips, but you got to find the tips that work for you. Yeah, and you can't you know try, you know, if you get 50 takeaways from a book in a month and then implement all 50 and then yeah, do it no. again the next month, it's just, it's just crazy. You know, it like two. Yeah, that's cool. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, mentorship, do the work, and then analyze the situations. So what do you mean by analyze the situations? Well, I guess my example might be if I go back to playing hockey on Wednesday mornings. Wednesdays were good days. Right. So 
I got out of that, hey, if I exercise maybe every morning or every other morning, then I'll have more good days or, or lower stress days. So that would be an idea of analyzing things. Um, something might be, when you're dealing with people, for sure, I deal with a lot of contractors and a lot of money. And uh, sometimes you're trying to get your point across and, and the other side isn't hearing you. But then on, this, on the flip side, you're not hearing it from their perspective. Oh, that's so cool. So one of my... I uh, love that you went there. Yeah. That's great. One of the things I always try and do, and I try and tell our young engineers and technologists, especially when they're getting into dealing with con, uh, contractors in a contract administration role, is put yourself in the contractor's shoes. Empathy. You know, where is he coming from? Because there's always uh, some place to meet in the middle. Most people want to solve a problem. Uh, I came up, we had a very trying project about five years ago, and I came up with the term uh, equally unhappy. And the contractor at the time, he actually laughed. And we were, we were sitting there trying to negotiate a $700,000 extra claim. And uh, I said, you know what? I don't think anybody's in the headspace to do this today. Let's, let's, let's break. Let's come back in a week. And I said, uh, the client here isn't ready to, ne to finalize the negotiation. I said, I'm sure we could sit here and negotiate until everyone's equally unhappy. But, you know, let's just go away with that mindset. Right. and come back in you know a few days and we'll finish this and uh, that actually worked out to be a pretty good strategy it was just a roll of the dice for me at the time sure but it worked out really well and in the end we negotiated a uh, settlement um, uh, nobody was happy but everybody was equally unhappy right and it was kind of a godsend that I threw I just came up with that term in the meeting equally unhappy and everybody agreed that they could live with being equally unhappy that's cool <laughs> And that's great. because let's face it, you know, if the owner wants to pay three hundred thousand and the contractor thinks he needs seven hundred thousand, you know, there's there's there is a middle ground somewhere. Right. And everybody has to eat a little bit, but we all know that there's lots of work out there. We're all going to be working on other jobs, uh, and we all have to work in the same community. That you know, in the community I work in is engineering and construction. Yeah. So like, you don't have one offs. You always run into you can't burn a bridge because you run into the same contractor or that other uh, municipal staff or whatever. Uh, in the future. Well, and relationships really it's are like our currency. That's right. More so than anything else. And, so. you know, jobs jobs go well and jobs sometimes don't go well. But they can always end without uh, having an enemy. That's cool. And I think what you said at the very beginning is a huge part of that, that, you know, seeing it from the other person's perspective. Oh, for sure. Um, bringing empathy and listening into situations. Well, that's that, that, that's huge in the office, too, when you're, when, you're, when you're leading people or you're managing people. You know, uh, maybe somebody's having an issue. And it's like, well, I don't know what the hell that guy's doing. Well, like, if you follow Simon Sinek, he says, why don't you ask him? <laughs> you know, maybe you're going to find out that he, he has a sick child at home. Maybe you're going to find out that his uh, grandmother just passed away. Maybe there's, maybe there's another reason. Right. At least suss out a little bit of that In a situation. to inform your decision. That's right. Yeah, that's and it, cool. it's And it's hard to sort of step back and then put yourself in their shoes. And I'm guilty of a lot of times not doing that. Uh, you know, because it's always easier to, to preach and offer advice than it is to take your own advice. Right. So, actually quite fortunate I work with people, you know, who will, uh, we've got a pretty good trusted group that will come in and say, you know what, like, maybe you're not in the mindset to deal with this today. <laughs> and you know what, yes, I, I, you're right, I am not. Or, I feel perfectly comfortable at work saying, you know what, I know this is an issue, but I don't have the energy or the mind space to deal with this today. Can we deal with it tomorrow? Right. And that's interesting. I think a lot of times, um, you know, when in, in my experience, both personally and with other, you know, leaders, there's this tendency to want to deal with it immediately. That's right. You um, want to fix the problem. But that doesn't always necessarily work out, no. <laughs> especially if emotions are running out. That's right. So we had an engineer that worked for us, and uh, I did a job with him about 10 years ago. He's since retired. And I remember there was an issue on site, and I would phone him up and say, we need an answer, we need an answer, we need an answer. And he says... Do we need an answer today? And his technique was, if he didn't, if there wasn't a super fire burning, he would say, let's let's look at this tomorrow. And his theory was, by the time tomorrow comes, we would have ran through five different scenarios in our minds, plus the contractor would have run through four or five scenarios, and the cream rises to the top, and tomorrow or the next day, we come to a better solution, usually at a less price. Cool. And uh, his name was Dave Grohlman, I'll give him a shout out. Yeah. And, uh, I, I teach that at the office as, as I said, uh, pull a Grohlman, take a Grohlman, take, <laughs> take 24 hours and think about it and look at it tomorrow after you've slept on it 
and uh, usually it doesn't look as bad and usually a solution arrives. That's cool. It's really interesting how the brain works, right? And like how it humans is, work yes. and how time can be really helpful in decision making. And there's lots of sort of philosophical books on that too. Big time. So uh, no pun intended. Yeah. If you were to go back now to say yourself when you were 38 and you started off on this path of leadership that you've been on for a number of years, what's something that you know now that you wish you had told yourself then? Oh boy, there's a, there's a million things. Um, one would be be a little more aware. Um, don't think of yourself as much. It's not about you. It's about the people. And um, oh, I just lost it. I was on the tip of my tongue. But yeah, just be more aware. And, oh, put yourself in other people's shoes more. That would be the one big tip that I think uh, has helped me a lot. And I wish I'd learned that sooner. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I think we get uh, kind of caught up in our own heads a lot. Because you're right. Uh, we say so much to ourselves every single day. Just right. Well, like I said, I think it's we give great advice, but we don't like to listen to our own advice. Yeah, that's cool. So, thank you for doing this, Steve. This was a lot of fun. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot, Rob. Okay, awesome. See you guys. Take care.